This is my attempt at 1700 horsepower, not more because of my turbo will limit out of that, but that is the most horsepower I can make with this engine, with the chassis, with everything. This is go time. I'm sure I'm not the only person to do this. These are our, our side seals. What I did was took the calipers and just grabbed all of them at once and then pulled the ones that weren't being held in because that was the, clearly the largest one, right? And then continued to do that until they no longer were able to grab with the correct distance, the correct thickness, meaning that they were under spec and I threw those out. Now, why did I grab them at the corner? Because that's one of the places that they wear the most. The center area doesn't wear as much. It's the corners that get bent up or get clipped or if your porting's bad. So this is my pile of uh, the misfit toys. The top one, can you see what's wrong with it? It hooks up. It is thinner at the tip. But right in there, you can kind of see it. I'm sure it could be reused. Would it create a little bit of compression difference? Probably. Is that going to destroy motor? Nah. But this is our attempt to make as much power as possible. And so that has no place in this motor. I also noticed I had a couple springs behind those. It's really easy with the bigger the motor is because you now have kind of a control group. And you'll start seeing some of these ends are flattened, pieces are flattened. These are FC side seal springs. They're like $4 a piece. They're relatively inexpensive. But Mazda Trick sells both these and FD ones. FD ones are Inconel. They're slightly more wear resistant to heat. And I will test those to see if those help better. They're effectively the same. They have the same distances and all that. Same thing with Apex Seal Springs. So the one on the left is less bowed, which is bad. That's less springy. Right now, if I was to mix all these up to you, you would not be able to identify which rotor they came from, which is a good sign. The only one that I can really notice is this one right here. It's got some like shininess to it. All the rest of them, not so much. You can't see that little edge, the cutting edge on these. This, in my opinion, and uh, again, this is my opinion only, I'm working on my own knowledge and experience, is showing that these are harder apex seals than I was expecting, meaning that they take longer to wear in on the motor. There's only one other car in this shop that uses these exact same seals, and that's the rotary vet. And that was suffering from okay compression without any problems. It was like 86 mm -hmm. on average, we kept checking it. Not that we had a problem, but we were just seeing, does, is the dyno gonna make it worse and so on. It wasn't until we did the burnout at the burn yard in Vegas that we noticed compression went up to 120. How? So it's teaching me a lot that if you go with harder apex seals, that's where there is a break in period if you're expecting to get better compression. I don't mean like 50,000 miles or whatever people say. I just think it means a high amount of heat, slightly lower amount of premix, just so that way you actually do get friction between this and the chromium and they do bed in properly. Anytime our ignition system went up to its full 80 amps, it was overloading my power system because the fan was also going at once. So anytime the four rotor got up to full operating temperature, the ignition system would start cutting a little bit because the fans were on and I was just overloading everything. Ignition system doesn't need to do that, so we're about to see some really crazy shit. We have so many big things coming up for 2023. It's almost like it's time to make some plans and New Year's resolutions, which I'm not a resolution guy, but with my birthday around the same time, it seems like it's time to make sure that we focus on what we do best and what we need to do better. And so one of the coolest things to that is with this massive race coming up with the four rotor, I figured, you know what? It's time to do another merch drop. Now this isn't in your face loud, like, oh my God, you need to buy merch. You know, anytime we do a merch drop, something crazy is going to happen. And so this one is very near and dear to my heart because we are actually also improving what we do. So many of you guys have had troubles with ordering in the past and it kills me because you're the ones that want to support the most and so we have decided to take it all in-house and you can't speak more true to how center and focused that is when it's the only thing sitting in the middle of our lift it shows our dedication to what we find important and i think it's more fun to have it in here because you know we touched it we're packaging it you can see it in the corner your shirt might have been the one that was on camera while we're doing everything this stands for something massive in my life and, and for many of you too is to come out to california is a dream to succeed in california is the real unlikely you know american dream and to have the four rotor running is that as well and so i know a lot of you guys wanted to do hoodies and so we're finally doing a hoodie again this is our rotors in paradise beautiful rendition of what we did just recently having the car shooting flames out by turbo smart and so we've got a shirt and the hoodie erica was suggesting that i wear an extra large because i've gained a couple pounds but at what 196 it's a nice fit it's a tight fit but for me it's a nice fit same as the previous one large but uh in erica's opinion my my clothes are running a little small and so the shirt has the nice little lambda style rotor 
on the front, almost the exact same size as the badge on the back of the car, which Patreon members will actually get theirs shipped out with this whole adventure. But yeah, it's this piece right here. So the same, same badge on the shirt. And then the hoodie is the same cut as the tan one from before. So same quality, same nice details, all that sort of stuff. I'm not really a good salesman when it comes to clothing, but you know when I put my name on it, it's quality. And we have a nice little bonus that if you guys are interested in buying both a shirt, whether it's a Dom shirt, which we restocked, or this shirt and the hoodie, you'll get a signed poster for free. And so it's the poster of us sitting out in the Animal Kingdom safari place with the card looking beautiful for the very first time having a complete body. 23 is just nuts for this car. We're talking all the carbon, all the chassis, all of the improvements. I mean, this video itself is proof of that. It's one hell of a ride, and I appreciate you guys have been sticking around this long, but if you want to continue and see just how far this rabbit hole goes, go to domracing.com and you can see uh, all of what I'm talking about there. This is not something that we're gonna have it where we, you reorder. It's literally what we have is what we'll sell. So you know that it's being shipped. Now the cool part is shipping is being done by us and my girlfriend Erica, who is the most thorough detail oriented person I know. I couldn't ask for a better partner, and especially when it comes to doing this sort of stuff. I know that she'll make sure all you guys get taken care of. So it's like I said, it's downracing.com and uh, we'll get back to exactly what we're planning to do with this monstrosity. We have bought about $2,000 in parts. Got a couple spares of everything. The most expensive part about that is these little tambourines here. This doesn't look bad at all until you realize what it's actually supposed to look like. This is out of my old little Cosmo motor that I haven't done anything with. And you can see the difference is very clear. These are used as well. But do you see that lip right there? That silver lip? Yeah, you can see the wear really well. Yeah, you can see it very well. That is friction. That is friction in a picture, personified. That is additional wear on the motor. Thankfully, again, Valvoline's there to prevent it, but that's what this is. Going in a circle like this. Why did this happen? First of all, I reused most of these from the motor from the very beginning, and I did not have a vacuum regulator on the system. Dry sump systems require vacuum to work, right? They're, they're sucking out blow-by gases. They're sucking out the oil. The problem is... Most people don't realize that Cosworths and other high-end race guys don't let the vacuum go completely unchecked. They don't just say, hey, suck until you can't suck anymore, <laughs> which would be a great problem to have. The thing is, is that it's about negative four PSI. They, they have inches of mercury. They have other different ways, you know, KPA, but it's basically negative four and a half PSI of pressure. And then you get diminishing returns as you go further. There are some people that run a lot more, but that is not absolute insane vacuum. That's just basically a slight amount of vacuum. Your car sometimes idles way louder than that. The oil system all drains down to the pan. The pan is at negative, let's say 10 PSI for example. The biggest surface area that it can pull a vacuum upon is the oil controller. And that's why when we take this motor apart, you see all the seals and everything just fall out. In normal motors, you don't see it as often. They're still stuck in there. And so we are replacing almost all of the oil control rings because they have been sucked down to the surface and have worn against the tungsten. Thank God they did not wear through it beyond my ability to measure it. Even if I put it in the CNC machine and measured here, the heat of the room would make a bigger difference on, on that surface. This is a four rotor, right? So you have multiple plates all the way from here to here. I was able to extract one of my pieces of the gray silicon off of the leg here. And I don't know if you guys remember from any of my installation videos, being superstitious, I always put a little bit here and I put a, a little bit here. My theory was, is that things are all coming together, that that is a non-zero thickness substance, that it would cause the thing to accordion at the bottom. I didn't know how much until now. I was able to peel off a small chunk of this. That is a very thin layer right there. I was able to peel that whole section off and I measured this and it came out to a thousandth and a half. That was a very shallow leg of application. It was purposely done quickly. This motor takes longer to install, so it might have set up longer, but it still was 1.5 thousandths. Over the course of four or five plates, two on each side of each motor, that's a, a consequential difference causing the bottom to move up. If the motor was built to be this way, and now you're adding this material, your bearings are going to be affected. And so, thankfully, I made sure that the top parts got it too, and sure enough, they were just as thick. So the motor technically was an extra four thousandths or so longer than it needed to be, but it didn't have an effect on the bearing shapes. We're gonna go ahead and clean all this motor up, nice little peaceful process, repack the rotors, 
reassemble. This isn't our fight right now. This is just to make sure that the motor is good. The change from what we've been doing to what we're doing now is control between the four rotors. We've, for the longest time, only had EGTs and they weren't calibrated. We had a lot of weird things going on. One of the problems we found is that rotor two was always like extra damp, extra dank, if you will. <laughs> um, and so... <laughs> oh, it's a one day stop. <laughs> and so with that dankness, you, you just got, gotta be 100. You just gotta be low key about yeah, it, you know? Yeah. And no cap. very low key. And, yeah, so... <laughs> So the issue is, uh, I pulled Rotor 2's number one injector, so the first injector that's keeping it idling, and anytime you give it throttle response, that injector is the one responsible for it. It looked like I did leaning over the toilet after I took uh, two shots to every one shot of everybody else, uh, <laughs> with like this ring of like froth around its mouth, and the other ones didn't. And so it's very traumatic for me to see that, and um, it is time to go get the injectors cleaned. That way, when we go and make all the adjustments, per rotor for EGTs and oxygen sensors that we're not adjusting for the indifference in injectors. Very important detail. This is more of a consistency thing. We want everything to be consistent so that way the only thing that could really be fucked up is the amount of fluid we're adding or the amount of air that's getting. Uh, we know everything else well, is, yeah, with is the, good and consistent. We, I know already that rotor one at idle gets more air and then at full tilt rotor four gets more air. That's just based off of EGTs like all things else considered the same. So that is very interesting to see, but at least we have all eight primary injectors and all eight secondary injectors ready for cleaning. We did not do any sort of periodic maintenance on this motor or car or anything. It's just, you know, like, there's tons of like Bondo dust on the, yeah. it, it's, it's bad. You hook them all up. This is like, kind of like a feel up pretty much and it has your PSI and you put your injector thing in there. You can only do four at a time, so I'm gonna do this four times because I have 16. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flow test them for a certain amount of time. It's gonna give me a you know, value if they're all the same. Okay, cool, those are good. If one of them isn't flowing too right, there's an ultrasonic cleaner on here. Let's uh, go ahead and get it done. This poor little machine, these are 2600s across the board. This is a lot of fuel. Right now I'm doing a shift speed test so it gives you like a lower, you know, t -t 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 -t, higher, higher, higher. You're pretty much like you're pressing the throttle, so it's demanding more and more fuel. But so what's happening is, you see, it starts off at a good PSI because it's, it's not opening as much. Then it opens up more, then it opens up more, and the PSI just drops to zero all the way at the end because it's using all the fuel that the, this little pump could could produce. So you see the PSI, okay, so that's normal. It's like idle, pretty much, or something like that. <laughs> That's like high speed. <laughs> that's, that's all the fuel that this little pump could pump. That's funny. Here comes some of the minor changes that make a major difference in the longevity of this motor. So this is rotor two. You can see that odd wearing on that side. That is one of the very first things we noticed while really digging deep into the motor. Now, what you will notice, this is gonna be relative for you guys because you wouldn't know the rest of this yet, is that there's a point where it kind of stops and then starts to come back, that is the relative length or diameter of this. If we go down further, look at, see how that, it's actually much smaller, or it's going further. So it's about a thousandth and a half of a difference. Now if we go all the way down here, you can see that's about two whole thousandths. So this outer edge right in there is two thousandths wider than the rest of the thing. So it's a considerable amount of difference and we are going to make sure that the whole rotor is actually kind of at that level. And that should put us within the 4,000 clearance here. So it's really impressive. The motor did it itself and it lived to tell the tale. So I'm gonna just do this on the manual mill. The rotor two is just a half of a thousandth further than makes me feel comfortable. If you see Racing Beat spec, it says four thousandths plus or minus a quarter of a thousandth, and we're at four and a half. I don't feel comfortable with that. Uh, I'm sure maybe it's fine. I'm sure some of you guys are like, oh, it'll be fine, but I, I don't know. And the only way I'm gonna know by the time you guys see this video is by the time the engine's already back together. So I am going to use ENJ's bearing pusher, and I'm gonna use that to get the bearing out and then put a new bearing in very square because you're not forcing it in on angles. That is incredibly easy with that product.
Well, I've barely woken up. This seems like a dream. The neighbors are beating the crap out of something next door. I don't even know what, but one ethanol has come to life. It is one of the best reasons why we're so successful in this shop and sadly the more we're driving the more we're going through it but i guess for them not so sadly but i cannot speak highly enough about what this fuel is capable of because when i start talking to friends that do a lot of tuning they're always running way more safe than i am now, that's partially because i love risking it but if you've noticed i don't have any issues running this fuel as extreme as i do ladies and gentlemen the fuel This year, we are going to be powering every vehicle you see here, I guess short of the Diablo, with ethanol. And this is the R, which is honestly even overkill for what I'm capable of, but when we go for the peak horsepower with the four rotor, this is what's making all of that power. This is going to be one of the more controversial things I share because it is not a proven thing in my stable of tricks. And in fact, it falls in line with more of being a trick than anything else. It is science. There's no denying that. I am using tungsten disulfide. So W is wolf, wolfram, tungsten, oddly enough, and then two uh, sulfide, so WS2. What is that? It's basically just a surface treatment. It is not what people thought my plates were coated in when I said tungsten. A lot of people were like, oh, tungsten disulfide. No, those are tungsten carbide, totally different material. But it got me wondering, what you see here is a hazing effect you can see it's kind of gold and i don't know if that's more of the material going into it or if it is actually the tungsten but it creates a one molecule layer thick well this this is what it's supposed to do. this is kind of that snake oil level stuff right now but what i've noticed is that this stuff does certainly increase its slipperiness it's a dry lubricant a lot of people use it for guns and stuff like that you can tell the color difference between one that has not yet been done and one that has and you can see what what my goal is my goal is to coat the areas that would have more contact situations. The issue I have though is that this stuff seems actually really easy to remove, which was important because I wanted to make sure it didn't get on the taper. Now there are a couple ways to apply it. I'm currently using the alcohol, rubbing alcohol and polishing method. That's what we'll do right now. Step one is actually pretty straightforward. We're just gonna clean the surface off. Then I'm gonna go ahead and hit it with a little heat to bake out the little remaining contaminants inside the metal. Finally, I'm just gonna hit it with a little hit of some alcohol. I don't know how long this stuff lasts. I don't know if, if it's effective or not, but you'll see that something's happening to the surface. And, you know, considering that I like to always be trying something, that's what we're gonna be doing here. So when we go to take this motor down for a health check in the near future, we'll all have this documented and see if it made any difference. I've got a mixture of the tungsten and alcohol. You're essentially buffing it on there until you see like that dull. So easier ways to put this stuff on, air blasting or whatnot. This is just me as an enthusiast trying a first level attempt. Without this, Valvoline has essentially saved the motor over and over again. But I'm hoping that with this, it just treats the metal because the metal is you know treated already you know, it's heat treated and it's meant to be less wear so that you're already doing that even if you're not putting something like this on here being that my reputation is on the line if this motor blows up I have made sure to replace basically everything this is one of the most expensive things and in this engine it's actually worth it for reducing wear on the motor these are the oil control rings and these are brand new. This is 170, 150, 170 mm -hmm. for one side of one rotor. Wow. And so when you look at this side, look at how small the silver part is. You can barely see it, if at all. Let's compare that to what we're replacing. Surface area shows you how much drag we have on this motor at this moment because of the vacuum being too strong. So this is something that nobody talks about or even fully has figured out with rotary engines is that you can't leave the vacuum unrestricted. 
no benefit whatsoever. We're gonna replace those. That is actually going to free up horsepower. That genuinely makes a difference. Now, this is basically sweeping Valvoline in a circle over and over again, but at the end of the day, friction's friction, friction turns into heat, and that's all power loss. We're replacing six sets of these, so you're almost at a thousand bucks just in oil control rings. Two sets were fine, and those were actually ones that I replaced previously when I noticed that this might be a problem, and I wanted to see if there's a wear pattern. It's just amazing, $2,000 in parts are in the little big box. Coolant seals, these could be reused, I'm not gonna lie. They're stock ones, but they weren't used long enough. I actually bought all new side seal springs. I admittedly don't think there's that much of a difference, but you see the model number there? I'll show you the difference between these and the FCs. Virtually identical on the back end, except for the front. These are FCs, these are FDs. Same shape, same dimensions, same everything else. I've noticed that the FCs have white tips. I don't know if that's a consistent thing. At the end of the day, these are like three, four dollars a piece. These are 15, somewhere in there. So big difference in price. These are uh, supposedly made out of like Inconel or something more heat resistant. This is something where I don't want to risk it. And this is where a lot of rotary builders get into problems because they're like, oh, we don't know what works. So we're just gonna buy the more expensive thing. I'm still doing testing on this stuff, but we'll see what happens. The old ones are fine, except for one. I bought a couple spares of these little guys. I actually bought these for another motor. I only need one, the one I snapped. My other favorite thing to, to destroy, corner seal springs. And then I just bought two spare brand new side seals that can be cut to length just in case. This is a suicidal mission for these. No. Uh, these always end up dying instantly. E85 in particular seems to eat through them. I just bought a couple of those just to start the motor off right. And then finally, Apex seal springs. I bought everything to replace all of these springs on this motor. Consistency is what I'm looking for at the moment. It's not like, oh, I think they're bad. It's just that I don't want to replace two. And then, oh man, there's weird compression issues. I want this motor as consistent on compression as possible. So that way, when we push it to its limits, we don't have pulses causing weird harmonics or frequencies or something far beyond my uh, scope of knowledge happening to the motors. There's $2,000 just like that. I'm actually sending Joel back out to Monster Tricks because we pushed a bearing through here. I don't like the roughness. It's less than a thousandth, but it does not sit well with me. Even though I clearance the bearing more evenly, I've come to the conclusion that on this motor, because we want to rev it high, we need to accept that we're revving it high. And the way to do that with bearings is the race bearing. The more you clearance these, technically the shallower the oil journal in the center becomes. So you see that little trough that goes all the way around there? That helps with oil retention. I don't know 100% of its function in terms of like what is depth, what is height, width, uh, make for an effect on bearing. It's still something I'm learning, but it is common knowledge that the Mazda race bearing, which is about $100 more per bearing, has a deeper one of those. And I guess in a uh, high RPM situation or maybe even oil loss situation that can spread to the bearing for just a little bit more. Regardless, that is what we're going to be doing with this motor. We will not be doing that with any of the other motors in the shop, but because this one makes power past 10,000 RPM, we're sure as hell gonna be making sure that we do everything possible to push this motor to its limit. In the last shot, I just spent another $800 and for good reason, I just got something that's a little bit more rare. Is it collectible? I didn't, it is collectible. As long as you never use it, it stays collectible. See, it was sealed in the box. Oh, nice. So this is actually backordered, I think, right now from Mazda. Oh, really? So thankfully, Mazda Tricks had it in stock. I only got a couple. This is, whoa, no surprise. Holy crap, nothing serious. That's a bearing. <laughs> that's the center of a rotor bearing. But why spend an extra $100 per bearing? These are race bearings. I want to preface this by saying do not, do not think that all race parts are better for your street car. This is only because we we're doing 10,000 RPM and still make power up there. If you don't, don't waste your time or money with this. Because you see this deeper groove here, and this is kind of when I was laying in bed last night thinking, I didn't even know the race ones existed. They had a deeper bearing like this. I just thought you clearanced your stock ones to race spec. You can see how shallow that is on here. Uh, clearly, it doesn't have a problem. We began seeing wear on this motor, but we were using this motor different than most people. So we're gonna go ahead and push these out, save them, and put these in. They should be slightly looser, and our goal is to 4 thousandths of an inch of clearance, and the deeper groove will help with, I don't know if it's oil retention, I don't know exactly what, but you'll see when we tear this motor down again, just what effect the race bearings have. 
you see that meme where it's like, where thousand horsepower engines are actually built and it's like some dude spraying water on it in front of his yard. That's like this, where thousand horsepower uh, bearings are pushed in and then there's cat poop right underneath it. <laughs> that up just fine there you go there is a race bearing looks essentially the exact same but look at that deeper groove we're in the three and a half to four thousandths range that i wanted to be in that's the gear side which has uh, commonly been the tighter side let's see if, if this is an oblong bearing at all same thing four thousandths god we don't have to do anything <sighs> they all are in so you can see all four have the deeper groove. I mean, just by the shadow, you can tell it alone. Everything's reading four. So, what that means is that all of these bearings are four thousandths bigger than the ideal lobe. This lobe is the ideal size. The other three are actually half of a thousandth larger, so technically my bearing clearance is closer to three and a half to four, somewhere in there, but rotor three is very distinctly four. At this point, we are ready to pack rotors. This is going to be a very slow, laborious process, just making sure that our side seals are really tight and it's cold enough that the Vaseline certainly won't melt. Meet back with me in several hours and watch these eyes droop even more, but we're gonna have rotors ready to install and then a motor going in for you several minutes for me way too long i want you guys if you're drinking you know say like a four loco or something right now <laughs> when you pour a little bit out onto the carpet i don't care for all of these oil control rings none of them are broken but they're all well past due so i'm letting them go they served a good life there are six not eight because i had picked up that this was starting to occur and so i test it and i have two that survived the motor since then with six sets at 150 dollars it's a thousand bucks rotors are expensive sadly i wouldn't even reuse these in any other motor because it's going to start smoking because there's less clearance and it's more drag on the motor okay you do it you're not down i can't towards a fight club i'm gonna destroy something beautiful god do you know how hard this is emotionally i'm not even pressing it Ooh. <laughs> no there's no going back now. <laughs> Everything is very brittle, which means it's very hard, generally. Same. Uh, same. <laughs> We're all very brittle in this shop right now. And hard. And <laughs> mostly hard. I want to show you guys how nasty I've been cleaning this off. And this is organic material and VR1. and We did over, maybe over grease the pilot bearing too, but mostly oil coming out. Like. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a diesel car, you know? Yeah. The guys at X-Clutch have taken care of me. Now, I've bought all the clutches from X-Clutch. They have taken pity on me for uh, us trashing our own clutches because of just such an experimental engine that it's, for some reason, poops its pants and leaks like that. So I think this is probably our last time of being allowed to make a mistake. So we're sealing the shit out of that back of that motor because I'm not letting that poor clutch, when it's already dealing with trying to keep all the horsepower to all-wheel drive and all that stuff going on, it has so much, to, has do so much to do and we're just like, hey, why don't we oil it? Why don't we show it how good Valvoline is? This is the whole reason we tore the motor apart and the car apart. And this is what we needed so badly. Oh. Whoa. Oh, that's cool. They, they didn't have to do that actually. It's not what I expected. No. For my Australian mates, X Clutch is your world, uh, but this is the United States side of it, and that stands for Extreme Clutch, X Extreme Clutch. So if you see those clutches, same company, and they make a badass clutch. I love quality things. If you're gonna put your name on something, have it be nice. And that's my philosophy, and that's clearly theirs as well. There's more. What is? What's? The, oh, is that shit. Sock? No, that's a. Oh, that beanies! Is I'm stealing one of those. No, you're not. <laughs> Fine. I was just thinking that my ears were cold. I appreciate that. Oh, that is really comfortable too. Yeah. You know, it's coincidental. This is almost exactly like the same clutch I, I found on OfferUp <laughs> <laughs> for sale randomly nearby after, after mine got sold. I do like, I like their, their packaging. I like their packaging. I like their branding. I like the, 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 I mean, the purple is really cool. <laughs> he put an air tag on here. And the reason why this is funny is the last one got lost by UPS. He kept sending me screenshots and I, I saw he had Crutz Tracker 5000. I thought he was just looking at the UPS shipping label. He actually has an air tag on here. Well, That's smart. See. Yeah. Put a heart on so it. So some of you guys in the States might know uh, Steve Kaminsky, who wrote me a love letter. We have all of the clutch plates and discs inside of here ready to replace. So once the engine's back together, this goes back on and 
The car is ready to hit the street. These are the lifeblood of this motor, and it's what I've modeled all of my other engines after, but we found a little boo-boo. Somebody must have dropped this at some point, and it could have even been a shallow drop because this is uh, 416, 316 steel. It's not softer than you know the most hard type of steel you normally find in bolts. So it bent the tip of this. Now, you, what you're going to see is I've done a lot of very minute and very fine detail work to this to try and recover all the threads. Yeah, you could put this in a... Uh, like a tap and die set, but you'd cut a lot of material. And, and so I spent a while redoing the threads. Unfortunately, what happened was you can't feel the initial torque or the bite of the bolt because it's being held all the way through here. It's being, you know, it's very, very tight. So you feel just a constant amount of resistance. Here's the problem. That poor thread ended up taking out the softer material. Unfortunately, it basically augured the threading on that one. That is all the material we have to work with. You can actually see the entire outer casing of the casting. We are going to try and helicoil these. This is what's really, really nice is that, again, the threads are recovered. Um, and if you get it just right, it threads and it holds. But see the, the wobble on those threads? They're pretty damaged. So I wouldn't feel comfortable putting 30, 35 pounds of torque on this. Thankfully, the whole motor would be holding it all together but this is something that I want to address now and helicoil. Now it is very common on professional motors actually to helicoil either cast or more importantly, aluminum because aluminum and steel with threading is bad. I'm waiting on Amazon to send me my uh, helicoil. It's supposed to be delivered right now. All seven of these have a positive vibe check. They're um, very dank. They are dank. They live to, to fight another day, but these aren't so much used to compress the motor. They are holding it in that way, but they're mostly meant to prevent the motor from doing this. The tension on it isn't, isn't the most important thing, but of course, with this motor, I want even tension all the way across the motor because what we're about to do, I don't want any like, oh, we just cut one corner when we've obsessed on everything else. The kit came with what it said was a tap for M12125, which you probably would recognize that's not the size tap we need this kit to come with because that's the thread that's broken. I'm hoping that that was erroneous on their website or on their listing because the tap needs to be bigger for the helicoil to go in there. That's not good. That doesn't help me at all. <laughs> looks bigger though. Yeah, it does look bigger. So let's hope that this isn't out of the range. It still says 12 by 125. And it's much bigger because the hole is like this size. So it's that's the right one. It's the right one, but you have to be careful because that's listing. That's not, you shouldn't, don't ever put that because that is implying this is an M12125 tap when it's actually part of the kit for the whatever size thread this is actually is on the outside of these that's horrifying absolutely horrifying but you can see it's basically just a spring that's the funniest part about this whole thing drilling something scares me because especially if you're doing it by hand or even in a drill press drills walk i might mill it here we go we are about ready to make this cut some major difference is that we're not going to be using coolant this time normally we do but i'm hoping that without coolant on there it'll be easier to remove the cast chips away from the material. Oh, you stupid dude. I straight up turned you off. I Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing to the other one. Had we used a drill, it would have been forcing it to the side that it was cutting more. So this this very much centered it much, much better than it was going to be. Now we should be able to just see. And again, thankfully the threads all look like they're pretty much even all from each other. This machine can thread, but I just... Don't trust it? I don't trust it because it doesn't have like, I don't have the tooling. But what I just did off camera, was I used the hole on the top of the tap and actually put the machine into thousands of an inch and gently placed a drill bit on top of this with the same zeroed out spot. So that way I would start the hole off just right and you could visually see if you were starting to tilt. And I just added a couple thousands until the thing sunk in just a little bit. Like I didn't push it in. I just, as I was digging in, I'm like, okay, now I can get the tool out of the way. So very happy with the hole that was created. We don't need this entire thread. So instead of trying to cut it when it's already in the hole, we're gonna push it into the threads here, like that, and it leaves you with about three and a half, four threads. So we're gonna cut four threads off of this. So we insert it now, and then you actually end up popping it 
with this one to break that piece off and everything. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. There, I just heard the last part of it snap into place. Ooh, fancy. We will now try this. Oh, I feel like I'm <laughs> There we go. That's much better than it was. So here's what I did, is I just set it just roughly in there. It was only to get the height, so we're gonna get this roughly close. And then switch it over to thousands. So you can hear me clicking and it's not making much of a difference. See that? This is directly above the hole. So not doing anything other than just placement. You'll quickly see it start to wobble because as soon as I get, you can see it right there, but at least it's a guide to show me how far I am off. much better than what it was before and it'll certainly hold the 30 to 40 foot pounds of torque that we put on this. I think we're pretty much ready to assemble after all this weird work. We have done a lot to prepare for this moment. You actually have to build this motor from the center and that is why you're going to see this right here. We're going to build the front half of the motor first. Now I've, I've checked all these surfaces, everything is flat, there's no burrs sticking up, nothing like that. We're actually going to be setting the motor with these edges held down and the reason why is I'm going to be taking the two dowels and then these three custom length bolts I made, all thread, those are gonna pin this half of the motor up once we build it all. We'll skewer it from the bottom, nice little pressure on there, and then flip the motor with the rest of the E-shaft upside down. It's a very cool, weird process. Here is the core of the E-shaft. That is rotor three. Rotor 4 attaches there. This taper is currently like, you know, hand oil and whatnot, but that's okay because we'll clean it when it comes through the top. So we are going to place this through and under. Okay. We're going to have to support the long one, just like we support the E-shaft. This is going to fall straight through. I'm just making sure I have the right key for it. And then this surface, as you guys may remember from previous videos, needs to be as clean as possible. So on one, sure enough, as you expect. And then put some more moisture out of it. And this clearly works really well as you saw us tearing it apart. Okay, so same thing with the other side. Can't just do one half. Without any sign of the Hylomar, I have the lid for it. That's, that's cool <laughs> <laughs> because it's cold and we have these extra ball threads. I don't feel so scared flipping the motor when the seals aren't fully tacked in. Coldness is great for the Vaseline. Yeah, I enjoy disassembling motors that have uh, Vaseline. Vaseline and, and Hylomar. That, that at least is a positive to this. Well, we are going to put these two seals on. As simple as this sounds, it is not simple. It's just simply follow a pattern. Don't forget any O-rings. Don't forget to put sealant straight forward. Now, I'm not starting the clock right now because this won't set but I will kind of start the clock the moment we put the gray sealant silicone in this motor because for the legs or anything, because that stuff does set in a specific amount of time. Right here, you see how it's purposely slightly smaller? That's exactly why flipping the motor is kind of terrifying because it wants to pull in. And then on the inner ones, because they're circular, they want to push out. It's a really funny, I guess they both, pull in if you think about it, but these are a little bit more firm. I'm gonna go ahead and put the mating spot right by the intake. Okay, this is Rotor 2's housing. What we were doing is utilizing 
silicone for a couple of very important reasons. I measured the thickness once it's not even set, once it's on the legs of this thing, and it leaves about a thousandth and a half of thickness. So I purposely put it up here, a little bit of dab right here, and then on both legs, so that way it's square. I have very carefully uh, prepared these legs every time, and we saw that when we went to disassemble this motor, that it actually was so flush to each other that even without sealant, this whole thing wouldn't leak coolant into the bolt holes next to it. So it, that was very impressive and surprising. Corners here. Take this O-ring. And so now the timer has officially started. And the line, the beginning and the end, right there. So we will not push it down. Forcing it down, it'll pop back up and then it'll pop out. I'm going to get my favorite tool ever. You're my favorite tool ever. You don't even know. <laughs> Two millimeter Allen is slightly wider than your typical apex seal, but it's the width of the slot. And so you can simply prevent, I'd say 75% of your heartbreak by doing this. It's just barely enough. So th these have been sitting out overnight. We have all the same race bearings now, and we are going to use my beautiful assembly lube. All those people that were saying you can't do this, so quiet. We're going to rotate this to a known max compression moment. So that way I do not rotate this as it hits the iron, or in this case, my tungsten. Because as soon as it hits and you twist it like that, it's over. You lose your apex seal moment. That feels so good. This is actually a very tight setup. Some of my buddies uh, in a group called Hotel 7 actually pointed out, if you notice right here, my rotors are a little bit too big given that it's a four rotor and everything. And if I had time, I would grind this down, but the motor's doing it for me. We had like one apex seal spring that was a little bit flatter than the rest. And then uh, the same with one of the smaller ones. This motor is too important to not try. So the hardest part right now is that it wants to move when I put an apex seal in. So I don't want to put this one in. That one's a little bit better. And this one's got the furthest distance. So when I put it, the spring in, it's not going to magically shift the other corner seals. That's one uh, trick I've been getting more advanced at. The apex seals I'm using for this motor are specific just to this motor at this moment, and they aren't even broken in. They're much harder than the previous set that were in here, and that's the sort of learning that I hope to share with you all as I collect data. And you know, each of these cars almost all run different apex seals. And there we go. There we go. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, <laughs> it was that you're like the stash. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes if you do this wrong, that little lip right there that breaks off, that's the tip of a triangle. It actually crushes between this and the plate. And so you'll see a little crush here and this tip will get flattened. So it'll be a triangle with a flat tip and it's bad. Gluing them makes this a lot easier. You can see the whole combustion in action. There's a the little pocket inside of there and that's magically to me that little place let's say we make 1200 horsepower it's 300 horsepower being generated in that small pocket firing over and over again almost like once every eight to nine milliseconds properly seal this side you need to put these on and this is the first step of the danger of it being upside down so i feel good about that one the best part about having these long dowels is that it lets you see if this stuff's gonna fall because you know it's like shaking and beating and pounding it on over the top of this. Or this one's a little bit taller. Normally and traditionally the most terrifying step. Be careful for this gear. Something that's really exciting for me to think about is the fact that we had such a hard time getting this rotor off because we over torqued it, over prepared it. That is a great problem to have because now we know there's a limit. This 100% shows you the firing order of this motor. This is at the exact opposite point. This is 180 degrees from rotor two. 
So rotor one is this way, rotor two is that way, and then they say three and four are 180 degrees from each other as well. This brings me to one of my most controversial things I'll say about four rotors. You can extract probably more efficient power based on exhaust pulses taking the exhaust out of these two, doing a divided housing, and probably make more efficient power than combining them all together. It sounds like absolute shit. <laughs> There's a lot of four rotors out right now that have twin turbos. I apologize to anybody that this applies to, but this is my honest opinion. They sound like crap. It, it's, it sounds like two two rotors, like why? It just doesn't sound right. So when you hear certain ones from Australia, New Zealand or whatever, that sound different than the traditional scream of the 787, that tends to be why, especially when they're twin turbo. You think you got it again? I believe. She needs to know I love her. That's that's all that needs to happen right here. <laughs> oh wow. I'm I'm not gonna go three or four for four. There's just no way. There's... If you do four for four, yeah, this is I'll that's buy you a four for four. I wish you were a really? better person. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd just buy it because you you love me, but whatever, I guess. I wonder if Vic's mid rug would. <laughs> It'd clear like, your sinuses. <laughs> <laughs> it is time to say goodbye to Rotor 1. Legs are done, ring, seals. We're basically taking this little sh two rotor, going to screw these into three of the dowel holes, put a flat washer on there so we don't bend the center thing and then now we have a little block that we can flip a 180 and finish the rest of the motor. That's perfect. We're gonna need three of these. These nuts? Am I wrong? That was, that was good. That was good. Hand tightening these nuts. And we don't want to mark this center iron which is just 5000 series aluminum. Okay so that should start to pull everything down. What we're hoping for is all the springs to kind of just cinch. In a dream scenario, we would basically have these two forklift forks and roll the motor flat and then onto its top. So we're gonna kind of do that. Okay, so that clears that. Pick it up. I'm proud of myself because I thought about these. I measured them to a certain length with the motor together. Here is the beginning of the end. The end. Rotor three. It looks kind of the same, but different. What's going on is when we stack that side, all the gears were on the top of the rotors, right? But now they're flipped. Rotor three will probably be just as hard as rotor two because we'll have the middle plate that we'll have to align it with, but the engine's already kind of massive. So I think we're good there. In full disclosure, you can see this ring is polished and that shouldn't be. I can tell that that's contacting under high RPM. We're gonna do some snap rings and some other crazy stuff to this motor, but not this time. Yeah, three for three. Nice. Oh, oh, yeah, there we go, there we go. That one caught for a little bit, and it said, oh shit, my bad, my bad. The other one is down, and this one is up. Nice. I've been designated the Luber guy just because, you know, I get it all wet. <laughs> As a self-elected member of the Illuminati. You mind if I finger your hole real quick? 
that groove is. Ooh, you're deep. You know how we normally do the, the keeps ads and we purposely put my eyes over that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go ahead and... This is going way too smooth. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Finish strong. No, no, no. finish strong, finish strong. Finish strong. I can't, I can't. Finish strong. No, you got it. No, you got it. Don't no. give up. Oh. <gasps> there we go. There we go. Oh, That's it. I get my four for four. I get my four for four. That was a dirty execution. That's like when I'm a gymnast and I land, I break a leg, and I'm like, but I still hold it. I do the hold the Y. Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, what is a win? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you. Wow. <laughs> We're going to be very careful getting them to the bottom. We have to hammer them on, like gently, but the problem is I just don't want to begin hammering the threads in. Whoever machined the shit out of this motor did an amazing job. That was not us. Everything just lines up. The closest I'll get to like a star pattern is doing this. These are only about 10 millimeters deep, and so we have a lot to compress the motor with. This is one of my favorite parts, is getting them all to start shrinking the motor. You can see the gaps on the backside particularly. You see all those gaps? If we had a time lapse going, which we don't, you could watch all of this sinking in, and it's, it's amazing how much everything moves. So you can see, look up close at this one. That's how much the motor's already shrunk. That's impressive. That wasn't even touching until now, and look at how much that's got room to move. So we are going to use a digital one just to double check everything. It's about 35 right there. Okay. Okay, so we have the whole block down to 37, and I think that also accounts for just a little bit of the goo and the, everything on, in this motor is a little bit more resistance than the standard motor. Everything looks good on this side. So like yeah. Compressed and the ooze and everything like that. Yeah, same on this side. It didn't seem like that hit the shoulder at all. Yeah, I was so worried about that, but I, I feel really, really good. It took just shy of three hours. It is time to rest, seal this area, because this is our problem right in here. I might put like black RTV inside of this area. We're gonna let everything kind of settle. We're gonna move this now onto the table and appreciate it in all its beauty before it goes back in and the beauty is what you hear. I want you guys to appreciate this moment. I think most of you do is that you don't see this. All you do is you hear this and you mm -hmm. see the result of it. You don't get to appreciate the motor itself until you go to videos like this where it's like, oh, mm -hmm. that's what it took mm -hmm. to magically shoot all those flames. And you just forget that this is where the fuel and everything is making you know, the action happen. And it's so weird to me because as soon as I turn it on, I don't think about this at all. So we've been having some issue with vacuum and we have this little dildo vacuum thing that's supposed to regulate vacuum. With this, we're just kind of about yaying it. We're actually going to take that a step further and have the actual measurement for it. I do have a spare output wire that Rob made built into the harness where you could plug in different things. It was right here and it was blocking off the coolant sensor. So I ended up moving it back to over here and I'm gonna be able to plug this in and do some other stuff with it. What was hard was I need to get into oil pan area, but all right here is belt and stuff. And I don't want to put this right here. So I'm actually going to put it so that way 
Um, it's out of the way of everything. Well, the thing that sucks about this is that this is going to be used for the first 10 minutes of finding regulating pressure. <laughs> She's never to be used again, unfortunately. When you're doing things like this, that data is actually very, very necessary because what's happening with the control rings, what's happening with the oil pan gasket being sucked in, all that is actually very, very crucial when you're doing all this crazy stuff. So I was originally going to weld it somewhere over here, but I think with this being so close to the seal over here, I'm just going to drill and tap. This is an eighth inch MPT. Oh, five, six inch drill bit. I already have my little pilot hole uh, drilled in there. With Isaiah finishing that up, I've just been quietly to myself getting the front stack all done up. I've got the little keyway in there. The thrust bearings in and out, everything's feeling good there. I want to show you what I've done to the backside. I'm still letting that cure, but it is nice to see this in place. What we're actually preventing on this is not oil leaking out, but the air pressure being vacuumed in. I've never actually used a metal gasket on this car, and I kind of would. This gasket stuff is, is affecting the front bearings alignment. Actually, it's really interesting to see how well it fits inside of that bearing in the front. That, that tells you how much that front cover or what I've just done is aligned. Let's see, it's right there. I think I'd Permatex exists as a company because there's the right way to do it and then there's the I have to do it this way. So this is kind of more like a Hylamar type of thought. It doesn't fully cure, but I'm doing this for a very oddly specific reason. These bolts have came out. Now this is actually perfect for replacing PTFE tape. So these guys are about to lose their shit with me right now. Understand that it, I'm just using it as a very soft thread sealer. So this is probably even lighter than blue, which I, if I had blue, I would use that right now. Let me show you what I did to the back of this motor. I went about seven layers deep into this. I cleaned <laughs> everything off, acetone, burned everything else off. There's the splines between this and the E-shaft. I methodically put gray silicone between the, all of those teeth and everything so that way that, that would prevent the majority of the surface area of oil to push out through it. I then put it on the seating face of this nut and this and then also sealed it on the outside out here and put this blue stuff which I'm kind of excited for using more often. This is basically PTFE tape in a liquid that can handle up to 400 degrees. I torqued it down a little bit more just to kind of account for all this extra shit affecting the motor, but if there is one drop of oil that gets on that damn clutch, I quit. I will quit YouTube forever. I'll, I'll even put the really dramatic, I'm done, dot, 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 in all caps. I'll do it, I'll do it. There's 200. I feel good with that. Now knowing we don't have to go crazy, crazy high. The bearings are kind of dry because I, for the most part, I forgot to do this. If you don't spill, I'll be impressed. I, I got this. I got this. No questions asked. <laughs> I do not got this. No, you're covered. I'm pouring it in off the bottom of the cap. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> That's actually really good. Sure, it's this one, but we'll just get a little bit in that one too. So it should go one, and it should be this one. Yep, then this one. Yep, and this one. Yep. One, three, two, four? Yeah. These two are 180 apart, and between that, this one fires at 90. So it's mm. 0, 90, 180, 270. I'm excited. Short of putting the clutch back in, which is the whole reason we took it out, that block is checked, blueprinted, thought, out, thought about, cursed at, everything that you would want it to be done to. 
uh, what done to it is being done. Let me show you one of the biggest, smallest changes we're about to make to this car. This is us as we stand, and I have way too much shit on my hands, but that's kind of the same reason the clutch is bad to begin with. We're gonna go ahead and take this clutch off. Well, 90% of the clutch came off, so we're left with a flywheel. This is a lightened flywheel, but I don't even know if you can say that compared to what X Clutch gave to us beginning. And I was too afraid and too much of a beginner, which I still am, but very beginner, to run this flywheel. I thought it was part of the problem. So this is the first clutch I destroyed with oil. Yes, it weighs less, but this is the, the, the rotational inertia is nuts because there's way less material out here. So it's not wheeling much fly. It is really a big difference. So let's get the scale and we'll weigh that, how much they are different. But again, keep in mind, most of that weight is close to the center of rotation. This thing is no IndyCar flywheel, but it is about honestly the next best thing. And the only reason that it's this big at all is starter is out here. So the starter has to engage all the way out here. But really, if you imagine, the IndyCar is kind of just a little bit smaller in here and it doesn't have a gear set on the outside of the file because the starter is all in the back of the transmission. But you just look at how much less metal there is here to here. Let me go grab the little scale and, and show you exactly. This is what we were running. 15 pounds and a couple ounces over that. Oh, wow. I thought I was saying off camera it's about three pounds different. That's five. Six? Just shy, yeah, shy of six. Seven, five six. pound difference on the flywheel. And again, that mass is on the outer edge. So this engine very well may rev much faster than we were ever used to. I just had fueling problems, so I couldn't tell long ago. I thought that the engine was revving too fast. Not a problem anymore, right? So this thing's gonna sound even more nuts. I don't know, I'm just excited for this. So we're gonna get it cleaned up. We just hit it with tons of brake clean, but a real quick heat up showed us even more on the surface. One thing Valvoline needs to stay its ass away from is this surface. It's done it too many times. It's gonna stop doing what it's best at. We're gonna go ahead and unpackage the rebuild kit and see what that's all about. There you go, that's what you get when you, when you buy a rebuild kit. For your clutch. Isaiah was asking me if we were going to have to rivet stuff together. <laughs> How much run time should you get out of a clutch like this? Quite a bit. Oops. Quite a bit, honestly. This sort of clutch would last you a long time. This poor clutch experiences in a very brief amount of time a lot of energy because, you know, when we're doing the flow control valve stuff, without touching any of the surfaces is really my biggest concern here. Between each of these bolts, it was like brand new all over again. So you can see there's those friction pads on the side that are meant to hold the plates because the plates are all moving and chattering and even when you open and close the clutch, those plates have to do something. Everything is oil free, dust free. We will put this on here and we're gonna use red for this. I love four plate clutches so much. This makes my heart sing. So one of the things about torquing these on is that this is quite literally where you get your clutch pedal feel from. And what I'm doing is making sure that I do it very evenly so that butt plug stays there. And then there's a reason there's a torque setting because under that torque setting, if we say, oh man, oh, that's, that's pretty tight. You haven't actually gotten the pedestal down to the base. And so your clutch isn't fully engaged or anything. It's, it's kind of a funny mistake that you could make. Okay, yeah, that, that yeah. seems... There you go. One last. Problem solved. And it is ready. This is truly like, let's all stop, take, catch a breath, relax your shoulders, untense your jaw, loosen your jaw, realize that your tongue has no real safe spot, comfortable spot in your mouth. And then now you're manually breathing. And <laughs> realize that this is the moment where we get everything back together and just let the turbo eat. That, like all of the other stuff we're doing simply lets the turbo do what it wants to do and that is make some beautiful, beautiful boost.